You're listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. This is the show that talks about identity and access management and making sure you know who has access to what. Let's get started. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad. How about you? Good. I mean, I've got a little bit of a break from March Madness now. It's you know, for four days straight, I was, I was tracking it pretty hard. Were you? I, I, I'll be honest. I could care less about March Madness or any, really any college sports in general. I'm just, it's just not my thing. I'm a pro guy. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the beauty of the March Madness is to watch a, a 15 seed beat a two seed, which did take place. And, you know, it's just, I, I always cheer on the underdog. Yeah. That is pretty cool. When you see like a Cinderella story or something like that, I guess, uh, you know, you see the crazy finishes and things like that. About, that's about the only part that I'll pay attention to when it comes up on ESPN. But I don't I don't do brackets or anything like that. And I just I don't know enough. I would be like that person is like, oh, I like their team name. So I'll just pick them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, usually when I do a bracket and I did not do one this year, I usually, you know, pretty pick pretty randomly and I do pretty poorly. And, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. But even the people who really know what they're doing generally don't have very good brackets. Yeah, it's it's like yeah, you pick the the weird you know the, it's the weird person that doesn't know what they're doing. They they win it all, right? That's typically how it goes. Well, the yeah, exactly. Well, the thing that always takes me back is like when I watch these games and you see all the people, all the the players right next to each other. They seem like their average height, and then if there's somebody who interests you and you go out and look up their Wikipedia pages, oh, that person's seven feet tall or six foot eleven, and you're like, my goodness. I hope for his sake, he makes the NBA and makes a couple million dollars because if he doesn't become rich and he's seven feet tall, that's a, t- I think that would be a tough life. Yeah, no kidding. Well, that's the thing is like you're, if you're tall, everyone just assumes you play basketball or live ball or, or something like that. I'm short, right. so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I mean, other than March Madness, I've just been really excited about the podcast lately. I feel like. Uh, we've had such interesting episodes recently. So if anyone's tuning in for the first time, I think go back and check out some of the recent episodes and then also check out the uh, Identity identity at the Center Live, IDAC, IDAC.live. Uh, obviously shameful self-plug here, but uh, we're going to get back on that this week. Yeah, IDAC.live, that's our YouTube channel. We try to do weekly live streams. We have failed the last two weeks because real life gets in the way and this, you know, isn't our real job. <laughs> so we, we try to fit it in where we can. But um, yeah, the goal is to be back, I guess, this week sometime. We'll get to figure out a time because I'm looking at the calendar and I know we're going to have to move stuff around. So um, it is what it is. But yeah, why don't we start talking identity? Because I don't think anyone came to us for our, our bracket information, our bracketology, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I am very excited to talk about today because it gets into into two of my favorite things, identity and the future and the metaverse. So we're going to talk about identity in the metaverse and to help us with that conversation. We've got Dan Creed. He works in infrastructure security with Meta, formerly known as Facebook. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jim. Glad to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Get my little legal disclaimer out of the way. I'm here representing myself, not Meta. I'll Views and opinions are mine and my own, but yes, I do work at Meta, approximately 3 billion users and 8 million servers and crazy scales. So only 3 billion. I mean, it seems kind of low. I mean, that's probably just a normal run of the day, you know, IAM program for a lot of people today. It's close to half the people on earth. Yeah, that's, that's a crazy number. Um, you know, I, Dan, this is the first time you're with us and hopefully not the last, but one of the things we like to do when we have someone on the show for the first time is really kind of understand their background and, you know, understanding their journey from an identity perspective or an infosec perspective. You know, how did you, how did you get to where you're at today? Can I take us through your, your origin story from an infospec, infosec perspective? And then we'll kind of dig into some of the things that you're working on and dealing with today. Sure. So back in, uh, actually started back in high school. In 1991, in my senior year of high school, uh, first hack was me and a buddy on an Apple II in Assembler. I broke into the cable access television channel for the school because his girlfriend had dumped him. And uh, 
kind of hijacked and took over the uh, TV station and uh, posted some not flattering things at the bottom of the cable access television channel about his girlfriend. So that's how I got my start. Um, then actually went to school, started as a music major. That was my other passion. And, uh, I got a little burnt out of that. And at the time I was working at a small computer shop, uh, in Brookfield, Wisconsin and doing some break and fix work and a VP had come in and I ended up doing some networking work for him on the side. And, uh, then we got into talking about security and he found that I had talent and picked things up pretty quick. And he kind of took me under his wing. Um, and started with a little consulting firm called CPU that six months later was bought up by CompuWare. In 1992, CompuWare was huge. Um, I mean, one of the largest consulting companies in the world uh, in the IT space at that time. Spent some time there learning the business, making a lot of contacts, especially in the government and financial sectors. Dot com boom hit, saw the writing on the wall, started my own business for eight years before I got married and had kids. I traveled all over the world just, you know, oh, here's a cool boutique pen test on, say, Porsche in Germany. So hop on a plane and spend three months tooling around Germany doing high pen test, high, uh, high end pen testing there. Um, after about eight years, traveling 100% of the time got pretty old. Long story short, ended up with a bullet in my leg uh, on a job for the uh, DOJ uh, down in Peru and uh, said, no more travel. It's time to settle down and uh, get into the corporate world. And had happened to meet who later became my wife while I was working in Florida. Um, four kids later, 20 years later, spent time five years at a uh, healthcare medical records company called Epic, spent five years in banking with Wells Fargo. Um, now here I am, you know, 25 plus years into my career working for Meta, solving some of the most challenging problems on the planet. Hmm. How about that? How many people take a bullet for information security? Not that many, I tell you. Uh, That's a really cool background. And I think that we, we, if we have an award for most interesting uh, background, you definitely would be a finalist. So um, before we get into the metaverse discussion, one thing that's just fascinating to me is, you know, uh, Meta or Facebook, you know, in, in terms of having to deal with kind of disinformation campaigns. And I think what's going on with uh you know, the Russia war against Ukraine or however you want to term it. I think that's the right term. Um, there's some attempts, at least what I'm hearing in the news, attempts to, um, you know, create disinformation, maybe from both sides. Uh, but I'm wondering how that affects your role in the IAM world. You know, are, are people going out and trying to open accounts that are suspicious to you know, to perform the disinformation? Um, and how are you kind of handling that in terms of, you know, rooting those out, suspending them, things like that? I mean, disinformation is a big problem for us. It has been for quite some time, uh, especially as the platform has gotten larger and more global. Um, you know, I'm going to first start off with a comment that Meta and part of the challenges that it faces because the platform was never designed with the thought that it was going to be this global behemoth that people would misuse like, like many things. I mean, I know even Oppenheimer struggled with his work on the Manhattan project and we suffer from some of the same things and, you know, a lack of foresight, which now in hindsight is easier in that, uh, our platform is used in ways it was never intended to. And just like a hammer can be used to build a house, it can also be used to smash somebody's kneecaps in. And nation state actors and bad actors, um, both domestic and foreign, have abused our platform to 
use it in ways that it was never intended. Uh, well, this whole Russia-Ukraine conflict, the Russian government has threatened to label us extremists, which has also then has ramifications for some of the employees we have who are Russian citizens. Um, you know, and there's most definitely efforts from both sides to paint the picture using our platform in the best pipe in the best light possible to either side. So it is a big challenge. Um, I mean, there's been press released, you know, from our head of communications that, you know, we have been trying to limit this stuff and it does most certainly affect us. Um, but at the same time, it's a hard, hard challenge, especially given that, um, especially from the Russian side, the state sponsored level of attack is significant. And we do, you know, the typical things we have algorithms, we have physical people checking for patterns that look abusive and, and misinformation ish, um, as well as suites of automated tools, looking for things like impossible travel and some of the usual more common culprits within the IAM space. Do you guys have a policy in terms of, you know, hey, if you detect something that's uh, an account that was fraudulently created or, you know, is involved in the disinformation to kind of suspend that account, uh, you know, in other words, shoot first, ask questions later, or uh, how, how do you go about that type of issue? Uh, and then I, I think you covered kind of how you're identifying them, but um, I guess my question is, you know, is it kind of take a cautious approach? It seems like you would take a cautious approach, but the, whether the whether the caution is uh, to not suspend the account or it's to let's suspend the account and then re-enable it if we made a mistake. Um, we do take a cautious approach. But that cautious approach also comes at scale, um, like everything in risk, depending on the risk, you know, there's been a lot of controversy too. And like when we loosened things up a little bit with Ukraine, making sure that we didn't want to censor them, but at the same time, for example, not allow threats, death threats against Putin because it crosses a line. So there's, there's really a heavy balance to it. Um, you know, for some of the stuff where it's extreme, it may be flagged, uh, by an automated algorithm. And, you know, if it's severe enough, like something like a death threat, we may proceed heavier on the side of caution and automatically flag that until it's reviewed by a human being. But for lesser offenses than that, we may take a more optimistic approach and flag it, but leave it open, yet still have it reviewed by a human being. It all depends on the nature of the threat. And it, I mean, it's social media perspective is everything. And when you're talking about the internet and a social media platform where you certainly don't know all the people, you can't know all 3 billion people that use our platform, you have to be very cautious. And it's a dance with that line between censorship and freedom of speech versus misinformation and disinformation. Yeah, I would imagine that challenge extends to, you know, what is freedom of speech versus, now, now we're getting really heavier, right? What is freedom of speech versus the right to be offended or not, which is a totally different um, thing. I'm curious, um, from a, we, we, the question so far has been around, you know, the consumer side of, fa of Facebook, for example. What about employees? I would imagine that you guys are prime targets, right? For people to try and exploit accounts. What are some of the messages that you share from a security perspective when it comes to hygiene around IAM? You know, obviously I think of things like make sure MFA is enabled or, you know, strong passwords or, you know, whatever it might be, but what are the, some of the steps that you actually take to educate, you know, your own users to protect themselves from some of those attacks? Me and this is a challenge for every company. We tend to be, have a little bit easier time from the perspective that we're a very technology focused company. So the bulk of our staff is technology people. 
who understand the importance of security and good hygiene. Um, however, you know, at the same time, we're suffering from scale as well, in which we are over 70,000 people now. We want to be up over 100,000 people in the near future. So with that growth comes the challenges of that as well. But two-factor off, there's re recently been a push for even getting away from some of the more legacy two-factor auth than embracing FIDO2. Uh, you know, and I don't want to get too specific into our controls, but uh, IAM is something that specifically internally in the internal attack surface that we probably struggle with a bit more than most companies in particular because of our culture being moved fast and being very trusting and open. And we're at a phase right now where because of scale, we're going through a lot of growing pains in that area. Yeah, I'll bet. I think move fast is and break things has kind of been the Silicon Valley way. <laughs> Not great when you're when you're thinking about it from a security perspective. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, meta, right? So Facebook has changed to meta, which short for metaverse. And this is something that fascinates me because I do think that there is, you know, one of the things that we'll be looking forward to in the future are things like, what does the metaverse mean? Is it VR, virtual reality? Is it AR, augmented reality? Is it both of those, something else? I guess from your perspective, what is the metaverse? And then what are some of the unique challenges that you guys are looking to kind of solve from that identity perspective, or maybe just even InfoSec in general, when it comes to making sure that, um, you know, the right person has the right access uh, to the right metaverse <laughs> or whatever that looks like. Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, the metaverse as it is, is evolutionary. And, you know, we certainly have visions for what it is, but they may not come to fruition. They may alter, they may change because it is rapidly evolving. I mean, it's really fair to say that, like, the metaverse in general isn't even a dabbler yet. Um, you know, it, it, it's more of still in the womb, so to speak. Um, you know, I think as far as, is it AR, is it VR? I think right now it's primarily VR. I think AR is another offering because the value proposition is a little bit different. And at the end of the day, I think, uh, it culminates in merging the two where, you know, when you get the hardware to the point where the form factor is to the point where you can use it in your everyday life. And like, you know, it's, it's literally my glasses. It's built into my glasses. It, it becomes life-changing and the line blur between is that AR VR where I could be playing a game where all of a sudden, you know, displayed on my glasses in front of my eyes and aliens dropping from the ceiling that I blast to, you know, I'm driving my car and it can spot animals faster than I can on the side of the road or a pedestrian or, um, or, you know, I'm on the go and I'm on vacation and I want to share an image of the kids at Disney with my parents or take a video call with that while I'm just walking down the road and having it just pop up in front of my face and they can see what I see. And so, I mean, I think it's largely evolving the same thing with, you know, from a security and an IAM standpoint in general for the metaverse, I think that's going to rapidly evolve as well. And just like social media has and all technology does that growth spurt, it's going to get used in ways that nobody has yet to think of, um, in both positive ways and in negative ways, people will find a way to take advantage of technology whenever they can. That's why you're always going to have security people and guys like us, because as soon as we come up with a way to fix something, you know, they find a way around it. As soon as somebody comes up with a new technology, somebody thinks of a way that, Hey, this has never been used before in this way. And they will take advantage of it and abuse it. Dan, I'm wondering are, at Meta, are you guys using any virtual or augmented reality in the business context? You know, I, whenever I see 
kind of examples of the metaverse. It's like this emoji guy of Mark Zuckerberg, and he's kind of conducting a business meeting. I'm one because to me, that's a very applicable use case. We spend all of our time on Zoom meetings if you're kind of a work from home person these days. And to me, it seems like a very realistic evolution of, you know, working from home would be working in some kind of virtual office. Are you guys doing anything like that today? We are, and it is, you know, what you've seen Mark doing in his demos, we do as well. And there are some meetings that, you know, around the limitations of the hardware and fatigue that we do attend meetings virtually when it makes sense to do so. Uh, you know, there's a lot to be said and a lot has been learned since COVID hit, especially about remote work. Um, and I've been an early adopter. I've been basically a hundred percent remote for the last eight years. So I was well before COVID and I was also one of the big first advocates, like even when you're a remote worker with remote teams of using your webcam more liberally. With COVID, people got forced to do that and they're doing that. And the reason that I do that, like as a remote worker, is because it is absolutely true that still 80% of communication is nonverbal. And the metaverse is going to open up new avenues in which people can pick up on those nonverbal cues. So, yeah, I mean, I think it will become part of the business world. But at the same time, you know, what you see Mark doing and stuff, the hardware isn't there yet. Nobody wants to sit for eight hours a day with an Oculus Quest 2 strapped to their face. You know, the, yeah. the form factor, the hardware just ain't there yet, Chief. Yeah, that's been my experience, too. I've been pretty fortunate to have dabbled with VR for a few years now, starting with HTC. And now I've got an Oculus Quest uh, right over one of my shoulders that you can't see here on, <laughs> on an audio podcast. But I think that's one of the things that I see from an obstacle perspective is the comfort along with the price. And... For me still, the the fidelity of what's going on in the metaverse, right? I think um, people are probably used to seeing, you know, Nintendo Wii-like characters who are kind of like these general humanoid shapes. I'm, I want to get to the holodeck <laughs> Star Trek. That's right. That's where I would love to get, you know, room scale VR and, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily the visual quality of a holodeck, for example, from, from Star Trek, but at least something that is somewhere not stuck in that uncanny valley of, you know, okay, I know I'm still in a VR world and it's very clear, you know, all these cartoon characters and, you know, who's going to sell me skins for my virtual outfit, <laughs> whatever that looks like, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I'm curious from your perspective, does that resonate from an obstacle perspective as to more adoption into metaverse technologies, like the cost, the comfort, the experience? Uh, because I think until we solve some of those, there's going to be also identity challenges that come along too that I'd love to get into around things like retina scanning or facial or you know facial tracking, you know those types of things that some masks today are just starting to kind of get into. You know, how do you know, for example, that I'm putting on my mask and it's Jeff inside the mask and not my wife who's playing, you know, Beat Saber <laughs> or something like that using my Oculus Quest or whatever it might look like. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, it is definitely, some of those are issues. Um, some of them are issues that we're already tackling. I mean, if you look at the price point of the Quest 2 compared to the original Quest, you know, compared to original, some of the very first VR headsets, the price has come down. I mean, it's come down by easily more than 100% from what it was. Um, you know, and then when you talk about wanting to get to the place of AR, uh, look at the HoloLens. The HoloLens is still, or Magic Leap, are, are still very expensive. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there, but it's something that we're working on. And I'd argue that we're leading the way. I mean, we don't sell Oculus Quest 2 generally to make large profits. We, we've done as much as we can to drop that price point down to, you know, essentially have it be cost neutral and have been acquiring a lot of different gaming studios, parting up with gaming studios and other VR software developers uh, to take a two-pronged approach where we're focusing on shrinking the form factor 
making it more comfortable. And at the same time, building out, you know, the actual infrastructure and the software of the magic be inside your virtual reality headset. As far as the cost factor, you know, everything would scale and tends to reduce the price, but at the same time, everything as you miniaturize more and more and more, um, tends to become more expensive. And it, it ironically makes me think of the cell phone, which I easily can remember when the big thing was miniaturization and your cell phone went from a bag phone to a little StarTac phone. And now instead of miniaturization, because more capabilities have come into it, you know, you've gotten where you've got the phablet phone and a larger form factor, you know, that's a balance act and that cost has gone back up. I mean, what a modern cell phone cost today is astronomical compared to, you know, what it was a few years ago because of the performance and the multitude of ways people are using it. Like where we're at now with the Oculus uh, Quest 2, when you really think about it, okay, yeah, it's VR, but like when the infrastructure and the technology and the, as the form factor gets more comfortable, it's really not more expensive than a pair of glasses. And if we get to the point where we have merged AR and VR to the point that they're the form factor of your glasses, do I really think that that's expensive? No, I'd pay that for, you know, because I'm paying that for my glasses now. And, <laughs> but I'm also an early adopter. I, I was actually a Google glass owner as well. Um, you know, so I've experienced the first iteration of AR as well. And. So I have probably a bit more unique perspective than most people, but you know, that that's how I envision it. Hmm. I think that's what frustrates me so much is I'm, I'm very much an early adopter as well. And I, I see it, right. I see the future and it's like, oh, this is so cool. You know, my first time stepping into my HTC Vive, like five years ago and doing the Google paint in 3d in a room scale VR in my little office here. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, this is the thing, right? It's, it, it just needs to get better. And I see that all the time with all kinds of technologies. And I think it, it excites me and it frustrates me so bad. And it's like, okay, we're so close, right? And then will we actually get past that last mile to get past the early adopters who are willing to take the risks from a technology standpoint to get to that mass adoption? I think very much like electric vehicles, right? For the last several years, You've really, you really weren't a, a early adopter if you had an EV, let's say before two years ago, and now you're still a little bit, but you're pretty much kind of getting there. And now it's like exploding. There's EVs all over the place, but that, that tantalizing glimpse of the future is what, it was, has me hooked every time I try a new technology that I think that would be the best thing ever. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely interesting. The automotive space as well, like my Chevy Volt, which I got in 2013. So I am an early adapter has 11 million lines of code, which is a million lines more code than a 777 Dreamliner. Wow. So, um, Dan, I'm going to ask you to put on your Notre Dame cap and kind of suppose how long do you think until, you know, use my example of where rather than doing zoom meetings, we're doing meetings in a virtual boardroom, you know, we have to have the, the, uh, hardware to support that. I mean, is this five years in the future, 10 years in the future, or is it just too, too cloudy to know? I mean, it's too cloudy to truly know, but my guess is five to 10 years. And I think that it's going to evolve as well. What that actually means too, because like Another area we haven't even discussed that virtual board meetings and meetings and that kind of stuff could come in the form of holograms, you know, and a holographic general gener generation of a representation of people. I was going to say, to go back to one of the other questions you asked too, about like the security around the metaverse and the IAM challenges, like that's another area that is going to evolve as people misuse it. And as we learn more, but we are trying to think as much as we can ahead. Like some of the conversations that I have on a regular basis are exactly like Jeff said, you know, how do you prevent identity theft when you're in VR, you know, somebody else using your thing, you have digital signatures around your avatar. Um, same thing with, you know, 80% of communication is still nonverbal. So like one of the big areas that we're focusing on is 
the next generation of VR being able to, you know, you hear inside in tracking as well as inside out tracking of your facial expressions so that you can convey that in a meeting and that it can pick up on that. But then that opens up a whole nother area that could be potentially abused. I mean, could that same camera be hijacked and used to scan your iris? Could you use biometrics like your iris to authenticate who you are? You know, those are all interesting and challenging avenues that like play a little spy versus spy. You know, you want a good way to authenticate biometrics and retina scans are a great way to authenticate. But at the same time, then a company like Meta, who the media loves to bash on us, imagine the first time something happens with that or something gets hacked and now law enforcement or not even hacked, but Law enforcement wants to use that and has a warrant to obtain that data to, uh, you know, gather evidence based off of what somebody did in VR via their retinal scans in your system. And both sides of that coin are fraught with challenges and challenges that, you know, people are thinking about today, but have not happened yet because we're not there. So Dan, I'm going to go real deep here because the metaverse exists outside of geopolitical boundaries, right? So then the question I think becomes, what rights do people have in the metaverse? And does the metaverse respect the laws of, you know, geopolitical entities like nation states? In other words, if you have a country where it's illegal to do X, Y, and Z, you know, does the metaverse have to respect that? And then, you know, as you mentioned, law enforcement getting involved, Law enforcement from which geopolitical entity? You know, are we enforcing the the laws of the state of Texas, the United States, uh, the country of Mexico? Um, you know, I think there's some real uh, philosophical types of questions that would probably need to be answered. I think when we talked earlier, right, when we were prepping for the show, you talked about a law enforcement example of. What if somebody commits a murder in the metaverse or, you know, any crime, right? An assault, uh, or, you know, what if somebody is defamed in the metaverse now, you know, it, it just opens up a whole bag of questions that have never, the human humans have never had to contemplate before. Yes. I mean, I think that it does. Some of those we have had to contemplate though, cause like even if you look at what's happened and some crimes that have been committed on streaming, you know, which this platform I'm sure is well aware of there, there have been incidents, especially when you talk video streaming, that there have been murders that have taken place. Um, you know, and generally anything in the internet becomes a really fuzzy area that hopefully if anything else, this will drive some more regulation and more thought around how we approach law enforcement on technology that spans state lines and country lines. And cause it is a challenge. Um, I mean, throughout my career, I've worked as I've traveled a lot with other countries on law enforcement issues. And I can remember in particular trying to extradite people from Romania was particularly challenging, but you know, you had plenty of evidence on them, but again, because it's over the internet, it becomes more of a gray area. So kind of shifting from the metaverse, but maybe not really, um, just be such a large global public identity provider. I think you guys must run into a lot of privacy related issues. You know, you've got so much information about people that could be used from a security standpoint or, you know, the, the, the line really gets blurred between, you know, what is somebody's private information? how it can be used to kind of paint the the screens that they see or the information that's provided to them. Um, and then you have, again, kind of local laws around the world. I'm wondering if you could kind of talk through some of the challenges that, that you see that you run into in your role at Meta. And um, if you could use some real world examples, I think that would be real interesting. Sure. I mean, some examples that I can think of off the top of my head is, I mean, first off, this is a problem that spans more than just meta. 
Uh, Mana certainly gets beat up plenty for it, but like this is a big issue with how much information a people are willing to give away and even information people don't know that they're giving away. I mean, many people don't realize how easy it is to locate a person in the information age that we live in today. Your tax records, your GIS data from your home. If I know your name and have an idea of what county you live in, I can most certainly find just based off GIS data and your your home address, how much your property taxes are, in some places your phone number, in some places, you know, how much you paid for your home and your mortgage information. So there's a lot of information out there and it's not just social media, but like social media compounds the problem because like everything else, information as a whole is becoming pervasive in our lives. And when you talk about social media, you know, you're, you're snapping pictures where you're going, you know, and what you're doing at all different times. And, you know, companies are tracking that data for advertising. And, you know, a lot of us sign EULAs, <laughs> which are usually at least five pages long of legalese without much thought into what we're really giving away, but it's also the world that we live in. And like my personal view on it is, you know, I realize I give away a lot of information, but I don't have anything to hide. If I had something to hide, then that's on me. But, but there's so, you know, I see both sides of the coin. It's a balancing act as well as a razor's edge, but there's a lot of information that people give away unknowingly and as one of the largest social networks on the planet, we most certainly fight with that battle every day. Yeah, I think if people are giving away data, um, there needs, you know, they need to be aware of what they're giving away, what's stored, but understand what the trade-offs are. I think of, you know, this, the, the services that I use, like Google Maps, for example, you're giving away your location and your transit and you, in exchange, you're getting you no longer have to carry, you know, carry on AAA trip ticks <laughs> in your car uh, for us old schoolers here in the U.S. who used to have to actually use like real maps to get somewhere, right? Or to see traffic, you know, live and take detours and things like that. So there's always that exchange of, of convenience and service that you're getting out of it. Um, I know our time is limited here with you, and I wanted to ask a question around really just kind of meta in general, because it's more than just Facebook, right? It's also... Instagram, WhatsApp, I'm sure there's other things that are risk of mine, but those are kind of like the big ones. And some of those were acquisitions. They weren't built in-house, which leads me to believe that there's probably, or maybe there was at some point, um, some, you know, separate identity stores or identity silos that were out there. Um, how has that worked out from a IAM perspective when you have these sorts of other entities, you know, is... Is, is it the challenge that I think it is? Or what are some other things that maybe I haven't thought of from an IAM perspective that could go into making sure that, you know, those identities are secure, that they're being leveraged correctly and, you know, how you're able to kind of take advantage of, uh, you know, the, the cross pollination, for example, in some of these services that are out there. Yeah. I mean, it is a challenge and you are correct. I mean, these were acquisitions in which they did have their own identity stores and some aspects. They still do maintain their own identity stores and other where it's made sense. They don't, um, I mean, we were one of the early pioneers of federating identities where they may maintain their own stores, but they have shared fields between them and, and federation within certain levels. And, you know, like any technology company, when we acquire a company, we try to take the best from it and try to weed out the worst from it to come up with the best offering as well as learn and leverage where some of the companies we acquired have done better things than we've done. You know, a good example is WhatsApp um, and, and encryption. You know, we, we get harped on a lot about when are you going to start offering that to measure uh, in Messenger and, you know, we're working hard on that. You know, internally, there's already testing going on and it will be coming. And, you know, part of one of the projects I'm involved with is is leveraging the infrastructure that was built for end-to-end -end encryption for WhatsApp and starting to apply that to messenger traffic. So, so, I mean, we take advantage of those. And I think many companies, when they grow by acquisition, 
Um, and I've worked for several companies that have done a lot of acquisitions that you have that problem as well with how do you consolidate your identities? What's okay to share? What's not, you know, it brings up the larger issue, like in our space too, with advertising and convenience versus, you know, we, we collect a lot of information with a goal of targeting your advertising, you know, is collecting that information have some risk? Yes. Does it have some convenience as well? Yes. You know, especially like when you talk about getting into the metaverse and VR, imagine where you're in AR now, you're driving down the road, you've put into Google Maps your destination or, you know, whatever your mapping software is, because you're going on a family vacation and you're driving 200 miles. And when you're driving down the road, the billboard that you see actually has advertisement for your destination. You know, that's one use case that you can most certainly see that there's some value in targeting advertising. You know, is it perfect? No. You know, like any public company, do we want to make money? Yes. You know, the, the goal of any public company is to generate revenue. We're not immune to that. You know, all media companies, all companies in general have the goal of of generating revenue for their shareholders, especially public ones. It's the nature of the beast. I, I imagine this dystopian future where you're just driving and all you see, if you're not using like a smart display of some sort, uh, you've got just basically green screen billboards everywhere. <laughs> There's like this superimposed, you know, thing based on whatever, you know, parameters have been put in there. So, um, I, I'm in for it. Like I, I dig it. You know, I, I'm I'm a I'm a technology first guy. Sometimes on the bleeding edge. Jim knows. I'm constantly trying out phones, laptops. You know, all the OSs. You know, pretty much everything out there. Um, I want to get things wrapped up because I know we're running out of time. Um, but I would love to hear from you as a fellow technology nerd. I hope I can say because I certainly am. What is an upcoming technology that you are most excited for? And what I'm thinking here is something that's not really mainstream yet something that's on the horizon, something that you're really interested in uh, that you think is going to be kind of the, the next big thing. I mean, I think the next big thing, and we may never solve this problem because just like the metaverse, it's hard. And that's self-driving cars, because it's another area of our lives that's so pervasive and could have such a tremendous impact because we're human beings and we're flawed. And, you know, yes, yeah, so do computers, but the error rate on a computer can be, you know, through self-driving can reduce accidents. I mean, the data is already there and I continue that to see that being a trend, which, you know, that opens up new avenues of being more productive while you're driving, you know, having less accidents, having technology where we can put more cars on the road to travel at higher speeds and get places more efficiently. I almost see it like basically routing data. And the cars are the little bits of data and the roads are, you know, the pathways they're following. I'm a fan, you know, Jim, <laughs> Jim makes fun of me all the time. I have a Tesla, I, you know, I have the, the, I don't have the full self-driving, but I have kind of like that in between enhanced, uh, driving that you can no longer get, unfortunately, uh, without paying for it. But I'm a fan. It works. It's very unnerving the first time you let your car drive yourself because I, I think that there is certainly a biometric that can be associated with the way that a person drives. Acceleration, braking, you know, do they are they in the middle of the lane, the left, the right you know, <laughs> side of it, whatever it looks like. And the first time you let, you know, a computer take over and I'm not talking about lane keep assist, right, where it's it'll bounce between the lines, whatever me. It's taking corners and turns and things like that is very unnerving, but you're, you know, you're absolutely right on what, and I agree with you, right? The data is there. There are millions of miles of cars that have done this. And I do think the world would be a safer place when we get to that destination of, you know, it's a common technology, just like the seatbelt or the automatic, you know, transmission or, uh, you know, electric windows <laughs> or whatever it is, right? The cost needs to come down. It needs to become more, um, you know, pervasive from a society perspective because if everyone's using it, then it becomes, I think, something where everyone is taking advantage of the ability for all the other vehicles to kind of read signals from that and so forth. But I, I, am, I am totally a fan and uh, yeah, I, I'm all in for the self-driving. I'm, I'm looking forward to like, you know, taking a nap in my hour commute to the airport uh, and then, you know, 
uh, hopping in the back of an electric vehicle, um, like Vegas, for example, is, has tons of them uh, where you can, you know, get out get off uh, the airport at Las Vegas, hop into a driverless vehicle and have it take you to your hotel. Like, sign me up. I'm in. I will test for that. <laughs> Jim, how about yourself? What's uh, what's something from an upcoming technology uh, that, that you're excited for? And you can't say like, you know, indoor plumbing or the light bulb <laughs> or things like that. Or, or an electric pencil sharpener. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Jeff, first I have to say, if we went a whole episode without you talking about your electric vehicles, um, I think the audience would be very disappointed. So thank you. And self-driving cars was originally going to be my answer. Um, and I'm going to avoid just saying something ridiculous like the holodeck. Uh, but I think, you know, and it's, it's so cool how much technology has moved in our lifetime, right? I graduated high school around the same time that Dan did, right, a year after him. And, you know, nowadays you can just hop on your computer or on your phone and food just shows up at your door and you open your door and there's food sitting there. I mean, like, it's an amazing world. Um, but the answer I'm going to give is I've been working from home for 12 years, actually, longer than Dan. And I've been doing the Zoom calls and, you know, conference calls with without cameras. And I think this vision for the metaverse, being able to be back together, but virtually, and not only in the business context, but imagine having a family reunion or being able to, how many times when, you know, people are spreading out now, how many times when it comes to Christmas, does everybody not get together? Imagine just being able to be in like a virtual place or, you know, maybe the future is like you could be in uh, your grandmother's living room and there's everybody can be there as holograms or something, but even kind of as an in-between, just feeling like you're together uh, for a business meeting or for a family event or for whatever. I think that would, you know, that to me, like the advancement of that is just going to be so huge. And one thing that I've, I've said this a few times, you know, I, I'm, I'm a virtual reality newbie. Um, my son has a virtual reality headset and he talked me into putting it on and going into a poker room and I couldn't get around with the controls very, very well, but I was shocked. Like I felt like I was really there playing, you know, poker with a bunch of people who look like, you know, elephants or whatever, you know, it was a little goofy, but at the same time, it was so immersive. And I feel like if we could have business meetings like that or family get togethers, to me, that would just be really, really cool stuff. Sounds to me like that's the next business meeting, Dan. Let's let's set up like a, a web conference with, uh, you know, poker, you know, poker table or something. I'm sure you'd get plenty of uh, attendees with the gamification of, of work. I don't know if something that's something that maybe you're working on, Dan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, gamification right now is one of the biggest use cases for uh, VR technology. And like, man, some of the flight simulators and like there's a space one called Elite Dangerous that like the immersiveness factor of it is just like mind blowing to be able to turn your head and see, you know, out the window, you know, is just really cool. That was the first game that I loaded up when I got my headset was Elite Dangerous. It's a uh, space kind of piloting sim, if, if, if you really can call it a simulation of flying a spaceship. But you pull down the mask over your eyes and yeah, the, the 3d, you know, you're looking around the cockpit and looking around. It's, it's so cool. Um, I'm all in, I think for me, it's going to be something along the lines of like augmented reality and assistive, assistive technologies. So I think of things like, um, you know, the smart contact lens, uh, where they have, you know, ones that at least is in testing, I think it was several years ago. I'm not sure where it's at now, but the glucose monitoring, for example, for diabetics, being able to pop a, a, a contact lens in that basically monitors things like that or enhances your vision, you know, corrects, you know, defects that people might have. Um, you know, I wore glasses for the majority of my life. I got LASIK done several years ago uh, and it's the best thing I ever did. And I was like, OK, well, you know, what if there was something for people who are not eligible, you know, for LASIK? Sure, you can wear kind of a corrective lens, but there's always some some issues with that. But I think of that and then I think of like the augmented reality aspect aspect you know, being able to walk down the street with some sort of hovering arrow button or something that says, you know, something to watch out where you're looking for, for directions, or maybe, 
you know, there is a car coming that is superimposed that you can't see in a blind corner, right? Or something along those lines. I think, you know, we see some of it today in kind of HUDs for cars. It's kind of like one of the things that's been out there, but I'd love to see something like that be more prevalent in, you know, just the general walk of life, whether it's Google Glass, you know, kind of like you were talking about earlier, Dan, or even just a pair of glasses that you wear that is comfortable. The battery life is great. It's something you can wear all day and it just plain works, right? Something like that would be, would be pretty sweet. All right. I have, we, we, we certainly went down the, the future, but I couldn't help myself. Um, Dan, thank you so much for being a guest with us. I hope you'll come back and continue the conversation with us at some point in the future. But before we let you go, what is something that people should take away from this conversation when we talk about, uh, you know, identity in the metaverse? I mean, I think it's not just the metaverse, but it's in general. Be aware of what information you're giving out to people and how it's used. Because, and keep in mind and perspective that there's already, no matter what you do, a ton of information about you out there because information is pervasive in our lives. Jim, how about yourself? Well, I am day is coming up. Uh, the next episode, we're going to have Julie Smith from the Identity Defined Security Alliance for her third episode with us. Maybe fourth. I'm not sure. I think um, it might be fourth. Yeah. Wow. And this, I think, is the third IM day. So exciting stuff. Make sure everybody, everybody who's listening, I'm sure, would be interested in that. And uh, pick us up on the next episode. Yep. So uh, you can follow us uh, on Twitter at IDAC Podcast. We're on the web, idacpodcast.com. We're on YouTube, idac.live. I've got all the IDACs on lockdown when it comes to, <laughs> to URLs. Um, you know, Dan, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we'll have a link to your profile on LinkedIn for folks who might want to reach out or connect. Uh, hopefully you're cool with that. And um, obviously I think people know who Meta is, but you can check out Meta's websites. Uh, if you don't know who they are, um, you should probably get outside, <laughs> uh, maybe read a book or just look, you know, look at something. Uh, you'll find them Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram. What else does Meta, Meta do? Oculus. Uh, reality Labs as it's called now. Oh, is it Reality Labs? Okay. Yep. Yep. So all kinds of stuff out there, but, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Jim, thanks as always for your time. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up for this week. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed the conversation and we'll talk with everyone in the next one. Thanks for listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and visit us on the web at identityatthecenter.com.